Hello and welcome to the Overland Journal podcast. I am your host, Scott Brady, and I am here with my co-host, Matt Scott. And you just got back from Baja. Yeah, like three weeks down in Baja. That's amazing. In the love, in my new Jeep there. Gladiator. Well, it's not necessarily new anymore. It just isn't. hit 15,000 miles on it. That's um, right. But we're talking about building a Jeep Gladiator today. Yeah, yeah we're going to talk all about Gladiator. We're going to talk about which model to purchase what are the some of the first things that you should do to modify it additional accessories around camping and overlanding and general suspension i think we're yeah. going to talk about all those important topics and, and it's it's certainly timely because the vehicle is incredibly popular and now now there's enough of them on the road that people are starting to modify them not just the the big aftermarket companies that were able to get some of the early ones but you actually got one of the very first gladiators off the line wasn't it a special package or something? So it was actually um, one of the gladiators that was pre-spec. So the dealers said, you know, something along the lines of, yes, give me the gladiator. We're allocated a certain amount before the specifications were announced. Um, so mine has basically the options that has are, yes, it has pretty much everything. It was prior to the trail cam being announced. But yeah, so mine's probably within the first, you know, few hundred bins. Um You know, normally that kind of means alarm bells go off for reliability and things like that, but zero issues. I love this Yeah, it's been really good for you. And and I would say that your Gladiator has been probably between yours and Clay's Odin Gladiator, some of the two more better traveled Gladiators in the country. Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely. I mean, like I said, 15,000 miles on mine. I got it, you know, two days before Overland Expo. Um and I, I don't drive it every day. It's, it's, it's a, it's a vehicle that we've spent, we've invested some money into in terms of, you know, the AT Overland Summit camper and the lithium batteries and, 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 and very specific modifications enough that we don't want to drive it every day. Um, Cause that would, you know, kind of just wear the vehicle out prematurely. It so does. 15,000 miles of adventure. We drove it out to Overland Expo after it was kind of first built with the camper and everything. And, you know, just got back from a, you know, I don't know what do you want to call it a traverse or whatever all the way down Baja all the way to Cabo had my had my tacos down in Cabo and came back um yeah it's 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 been a really good vehicle i have to say that i'm i'm pleasantly surprised with it you know it, inside it gets maybe a little bit cramped um in the passenger compartment and that's when you recognize that it is still a jeep still yeah. a jeep wrangler but you know still more spacious than let's say a defender 130 which was always my kind of you know dream car and then this comes out and yeah, it having, is the modern equivalent of a defender. Yeah, and, and having spent quite a bit of time in a one thirty, this is Way at more least 1.5 times better. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, um, it, it's a modern car. It has radar cruise control. It, it's relatively powerful. I think. Sure. Um, Especially with that new transmission. I think it made a huge difference. Yeah. That, that eight speed, you know, that's the same eight speed that BMW uses in almost all of their vehicles. It's in, the, it's in all Bentley products. It's in all Rolls Royce products. It is a, it is a fantastic transmission. Yeah. You really can feel it. I, I think it's a great pairing to that three, six. Motor. Yeah. yeah. So, well, so what, what made you decide to buy one? I mean, you do have a uh, vehicle ADD, but yes, we know that we, we do know that I have vehicle ADD. Um, but what, what made you decide after all of these years of choosing to have more obscure vehicles? Yeah. What made you decide to buy it, to buy a Jeep and, and what made you think that it needed to be the gladiator? What was the thing that actually made you decide to make that big purchase? Um, oh, that's, it's, it's a little bit tough. I mean, you know, I, I, I had definitely always been interested in the concept of a Jeep pickup truck, you know, um, you know, I guess when I started with Overland Journal, we had that, we had that AEV brute and I drive that a little bit and just the, the concept of it was just really nice. Like that had in my mind always been a vehicle that had really great proportions. Um, it was purpose built. I think that's, that's the reason why I, I, I fell for it so much. Um, it, it does feel like a truck a, it does feel like for a off road honest vehicle to me. And that's what I like about, that's what I like about the current Wrangler. They've not done anything to it to really screw it up. Yeah. And so many car manufacturers have taken longstanding brands, models, and really kind of screwed them up. Yeah. They've turned them into crossovers or some kind of shared platform thing. Isn't the Blazer some, (laughs) I mean, it used to be, used to be a solid axle. It's it's like some kind of Chevy sedan thing now (laughs) or or, or whatever, but yeah, the Gladiator seems really honest to me, particularly in that sport configuration with the 
max tow package, max payload. It, yeah. It, I really like it. You know, I, I don't know. I love the thing. It, it's a very personal vehicle for me. Right. I mean, like I've known Mark Allen, who's the head of design for, for Jeep for quite a while now. Um, you know, I know the guy that helped design the tires another guy that designed the camper. And I, it's just personal to me. I think, I, I think that the Jeep team, I've, I've seen the changes that they've made. I've, I've, I see the feedback that they take from people. I see how they, they actually listen. I see how they're actually out on the trail. Um, you, you can't fake driving skill, you know, and when journalists can't get through something like we just did the Rubicon and gladiators stock with uh, the two co-head engineers, Pete and Liz for the gladiator, Mark, who's the head of design and um, Jim Morrison not from the doors, but the, um, you know, the CEO now of Jeep and, you can't fake driving skill. And all of those guys are, you know, they're driving manual versions through the hardest obstacles there. Cause they were, you know, probably the only ones that, that could, cause, cause most of the journalists couldn't drive manual yeah, transmission. Surprisingly, but you know, <laughs> for the journalists that were also on that trip, I'm sorry, but it's true. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just an honest vehicle. You know, it has yeah, great it approach angles, you know, the, the breakover angles, not, not super great, but that never really bothered me because I knew the moment I saw that way out concept at Easter Jeep Safari that I was going to put it on 37s, 37s fit. They look perfect. They look perfect. They fit with a two inch factory lift. I mean, I, I bought the vehicle and then they put the lift kit on it. It, it was, it was fine. I mean, that the, the rear shocks, absolutely horrible. Like they had, they, they were, they were so close, you know, they used basically it was a two and a half inch Fox shock with uh, uh, factory or was it under dampened or too was the damping too firm or um it, it just had no dampening uh, at uh, all um so it just blow through the travel yeah just no no compression no rebound it, and it was like you know I, I don't know how to explain it like that's interesting because the the max tow capacity max payload unit that i drove actually drove really nice yeah so the rear shock was well this this is the aftermarket mopar thing i should say right yeah so Um, they they didn't get the spring rates great front shocks great i'm on my second set of rear shocks at this point um you know basically waiting for the aftermarket to kind of continually embrace this vehicle i have some kings on order um so for the overlander who what would you say is the is the right model to buy in your opinion you know, I, I really think it's whatever you can afford. Um, you know, Scott, I think you have a lot of points with the the sport with that max tow package. I think now that you can get those wide track Dana 44 axles on every model, um, you know, outside of the Rubicon, you just have to have that max tow package. Um, and those come with 411s. I don't know if it necessarily really matters anymore. I mean, normally I would say go with the Rubicon because then you get, you know, you there's some the advantage. There's strength. definitely some advantages. You end up with locking differentials. Yeah. I, which I think can be, can be a real advantage. Although I was surprised by how effective the traction control was. Yeah. You have modern traction control on the JL and JT platform. And, now, and so. I, I think that just installed with that long wheelbase, just putting an air locker in the back could be a pretty good solution. Yeah. And then you have the factory high payload number, which is now 1700 pounds Mm -hmm. of payload. That's significant. It's, it's, it's more than any other compact pickup on the market, more than the Tacoma, more than the Colorado. It's more than any of the other compact pickups. And you have half ton components. Um, you know, the, the brakes are large. I I'll use mine for an example, you know, large tires, um, you know, I'm right with, with people right at gross vehicle weight. Um, and it drives like a normal vehicle. Like it, it just, it hand, like the, the platform was designed with modification in mind. And I think that that is the largest thing that separates it from, let's say a Ranger that, you know, probably rubs with a 33 inch tire. Or it's a coma right. that if you want to put 35s on, it requires fenders and long travel and this and that. Um, Jeep just kind of knows like, yeah, they're really good at it. Yeah. Like they, they get it. They understand. I mean, they're at, they're at all the events they know. Um, 35 stock with no lift 37s with, uh, with my factory lift. I do not rub at all. And if I remember the, the gladiator, isn't just a, a stretched JL, they actually brought in the Ram engineers and yeah. designed an entirely new chassis specifically for 
towing capacity and payload. I know that um, some of my early conversations with Mark Allen is he recognized that this was an opportunity for Jeep to make one of the best, if not the best, mid-sized overland vehicles sold today. And he wanted to make sure that they ticked all the right boxes. And that's, I have to say that that is absolutely one of the things I appreciate most, most about Jeep. Uh, I was at SEMA over 10 years ago. And, and uh, one of the guys who worked for me at the time says, Hey, this guy just came running up to me down in the South hall. And he says, you, you work for Overland Journal? And he says, yeah. And he handed me his card and, and I look at the card and it was Mark Allen, <laughs> chief designer for, for Jeep. And Mark was a subscriber to the magazine. Mark is a traveler himself. I remember him telling me about his, his uh, motorcycle trips down in Costa Rica. And, and he, he's, tr- he's truly a traveler himself. And we see that reflected in the vehicle. And that's probably why it feels so honest. It's just practical and good for travel. I mean, you know, you, you have a lot of right angles, um, with the camper, my, my AT summit on the back. Um, you know, I have a lot of vertical walls, it, that same camper on a, uh, a Tacoma or Ranger or something like that. You know, you'd kind of have a 15 degree angle or something going down to the bed, which yeah, granted means your bed's a little bit wider, but I think that the space is so much more usable on a gladiator. Um, you know, we took the back seats out for our Greyhound, um, you know, and there's, there's a lot of room back there. Um, it's, it's just, it's a well thought out vehicle. It's very yeah. purposeful. And and I think it's important um, if you are somebody that, you know, is kind of moving around on vehicles to support companies that are supporting this industry. And Jeep yeah. has been there from the get go and they, they are, they listen, you know, um, I can take this vehicle absolutely everywhere in comfort. Um, I don't know. People always try and, Oh, well, my vehicle's better. Or this is better. Or this model's better. Like, I don't really care. Like I probably won't have this truck in a year anyways, and I'll probably be eating my own words, but, um, you know, the breadth of capability that this machine has, True. I mean, you know, I hit like 90 mile an hour on a dirt road in Baja in a truck on 37s with a little V6 and, it, it was, I it really was enjoyed, smooth as could be. I really enjoyed driving the one that we had. It, we even did some toying with it, connecting some of the bigger trailers that we had. It was really impressive in that regard. I think, I think if you had to own one vehicle that you expected to do everything, yeah, technical terrain, daily driving capabilities, you wanted to tow your sailboat up to Lake Powell, whatever that was, and you could only own one car, the, the Gladiator might be it. Well, yeah, and, and it's, what, what is the vehicle that everybody wants? They're like, oh, well, it doesn't have a solid axle. I don't want it. Okay, well, this does. I want it with the diesel engine. Well, the diesel engine it's is coming, coming out. Yeah. Like, oh, I want a manual transmission. Well, you manual get- transmission is coming out. Oh, well, I want lockers. Like, whatever excuse people, like, there's really no excuses to this vehicle. Other it, than the, that it's expensive. And I think it, that's, it my is, only, that's my only dig against the, the vehicle is it is expensive once you trim it up. Yeah, it, it, it is expensive, um, but you can also, you know, everything that I'm talking about um, on mine, mine was over 60, yeah. but you can get one, you know, in the mid thirties too. High 30s and everything that I'm saying, yeah. um, you know, it, it, it equally applies. It does. You know, you're not going to have the saddle leather interior and the nav and the, and whatever, but who cares? All you the don't important need, parts are there. All the important parts are there. I mean, I, I challenge you to take a, you know, a, 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 a base gladiator and a Tacoma or a Ranger and put 35s on them and see, see how quickly the Tacoma falls apart. Even with the best of the aftermarket, it's going to squeak. It's going to drive like crap. Um, you're still at the limits of the, you, you the are differential a, diameter. And yeah, the you're, CV you're blowing actually. CVs. You're, you know, you're spending to make that package reliable, which can be done. I know there's people that have, that have done it, but I don't have that much dedication to a single platform. Um, and I, I just don't. So it, it's just, it's a very easy vehicle. Mine really isn't that modified. Um, you know, I use factory bumpers. The Mopar bumpers are great. If I want to take the wings off to make it a stubby bumper, because I don't know, that looks cool on Instagram. I can do that. It doesn't really do anything for me, but um, factory winch mount factory sliders that like I've taken across the Rubicon. I've dragged them across rocks They're for overlanding. They're all you need. You don't need to put these garage built, you know, hitch steel, super heavy sliders on there. This is a hydro formed piece of steel that's purpose built for the vehicle. And they work really well. I think it's some of the best 
factory sliders I've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. The ones for the Wrangler. You know, there's always somebody that's like, you know, trying, we'll always try and break everything. And if you're that guy, cool, go buy some sliders. It's a Jeep. There's a million of them out there. Um, you know, the rear. Yeah, I think if we're thinking of it purely from travel perspective, I think that the way that they come in like your Jeep totally is perfect. And it has like that rear slider, which is incredibly, incredibly effective. I and mean, it will, I've, I've had, you know, the vehicle hung up on it before and it's, it works. Um, Have you used a high lift off of the rock sliders yet? No, I haven't used a high lift in like, if I, I, I should be careful there, but I don't generally carry around boat anchors. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm a, I'm more of a traveler than I am a technical crawler. So I just, I don't even carry one with me. Anymore. Well, and the challenge with a high lift off of a, off of a Wrangler is that the suspension has so much travel. Yeah. That and it's often, so close you, to you the often vehicle. Reach, reach the limit of the high lift extension uh, before the wheels even come off the ground. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's, it's bottle Jack, right? Bottle Jack, um, bottle Jack, max tracks, whatever I have to do. Um, you know, changing a wheel is not necessarily a huge thing. Yeah. You just bring along a you know, piece of yeah. thick wood that supports the vehicle in soft yeah. conditions. Yeah. I mean, not that a high lift doesn't have its place. I just, well, it certainly does. Um, yeah. Just for, it just depends on the conditions that you're in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, one of the things I was thinking about is from my experience with the vehicle, I think it does benefit from a little bit of suspension lift and that's because of that break. Oh yeah. That's yeah. Because of that breakover angle. When I was testing the, the max tow package vehicle, even in Sedona trails that I wouldn't normally even notice. I had to take some different lines because of the, uh, the ability to hit the, the, bo- the belly pan. So I think adding a, an inch or two, maybe three inches of suspension lift, uh, and then a, a accompanying that with some 37 inch tall tires seems to really resolve that problem. Uh, wh- what are your thoughts on suspension right now? What would be, if you were right now to look at a couple different options, two or three options for suspension on the gladiator. What are you leaning towards right now? You know, the, the unfortunate reality for overlanders right now is that there really aren't many options. Um, you know, there were an AEV kit now finally. Yeah. But I I don't think it's actually out is the problem. That that is what I I will go towards AEV Springs. Um, you know, they actually kind of consider payload and, and things like that. Um, but right now there's a lot of junk out there. There was a lot of companies that were really quick to repurpose their JK stuff. There's a lot of companies that were really quick to throw whatever, whatever out there. There's a lot of cheap stuff on the market for the gladiator right now. And that's where I'm personally struggling. Um, you know, having more weight in the back of the vehicle, I need a coil that is, you know, has a proper spring rate for more weight. Yeah. Old man emu has not released new coils yet for the, for the no. gladiator. Icon is has some stuff out. Um, unfortunately just didn't work out in timing, uh, for, for the Baja trip. Um, and icon does a good job. Icon does a great job. Um, you know, they, they actually, they have a gladiator. They actually use it. Um, you know, their, their big prototype vehicle, I guess is, is clays that expedition overland. Right. Odin. Um, and that's, that's probably about as heavy as you could, could or should get a gladiator with their P core Patriot campers, um, set up on the back. Um, yeah. So, so unfortunately right now, if you want to, if you want to buy a gladiator and you want to lift it, I, I just say go with the Mopar setup because you're getting, you know, factory tuned spring rates, spring frequencies, things like that. Um, but if you add any kind of weight in the, in the back, the, the rear shocks just need to be thrown away. Um, you know, otherwise they would actually be a really great shock. They're just, you know, they're under so horribly valved that yeah. it's hard to begin to start why they're so bad. Um, yeah, but there there will be stuff coming out. I mean, you know, King has shocks coming out. Fox has shocks coming out. Icon has some, you know, adjustable CDCB shocks coming out. Um, yeah. So and then the AEV stuff will and the AEV be stuff will will eventually come out because um, they always address payload with their springs. Yeah, I, I have to think that the next evolution of 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 my truck will probably see maybe an AEV bumper. Um, one of the things I like about their bumpers is that they actually kind of meet the fenders. Um, you can actually reduce a lot of wind noise in the, in the Wrangler. Um, and, and again, it, uh, increase that approach angle in front of the tire by that AEV bumper. Um, and they're not that much heavier as well. They're very thoughtfully designed. And you end up with quite a bit of animal strike protection, which is always something that we, 
when we fit a bumper to our vehicles, we're looking for a couple, we're looking at a couple things in mind. We, we want to be able to fit a winch for self-recovery, particularly when we travel solo, which is what you did in Baja. You traveled all, all by yourself. And, uh, and then also the ability to prevent animal strike damage yeah. or even small, small vehicle impacts when you're mm-hmm. traveling, you know, you're in a village and somebody backs up into you. You don't want to, your airbags to go off and your vehicle to be disabled. So I do like to run a front bumper that, that, does well. It's robust enough to manage uh, those small vehicle impacts, animal strikes, and then of course self recovery. I'm much less interested in like ultimate technical terrain performance of the bumper, yeah. like day after day of abuse. Um, there are certainly applications for that, but I don't tend to seek that out because I'm often so remote that I I just simply can't take those kinds of risks every single day exactly. with the vehicle. So. I do like the idea of the ARB bull bar or the AEV bull bar because it does give a lot more protection mm-hmm. um, and, and they both do a great job on theirs. Yeah. Yeah. I, again, I'm partial to the AEV stuff. I mean, I, I bought this truck because it is a factory brute. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. They're, they're just great. AEV deserves a lot of, yeah. you know, acknowledgement and respect for the fact that they, they no doubt it were, they were the proof of concept for Jeep. If I was in a position back then to buy a brute, I would have. Yeah. You know, it's just that this is just how it worked out, yeah. I guess. Um, yeah. They were very, very, very cool vehicles. Now, once you get that little bit of suspension on there, what are your thoughts around tires and wheels right now? Are Did you change your offset at all? I did. I, 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 what did I you go with on the 37s? You know, I can't remember the exact offset, but I, I you know I run method 702s. It's a, it's a fairly aggressive offset. Um, you know, I kind of like that. I have a, I have a, you know, fairly high center gravity with the, with the camper. I've done my best to keep things low, but a little bit of increased track width isn't necessarily a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I kept the, the vehicle and Rubicon spec um, comes with Falcon tires, your choice of either MTs or ATs, which again is like Jeep listening. Right. I mean, yeah. You, know, you live in the desert, get ATs. Yeah, yeah exactly. So I, I'm a really big fan of the Falcon AT3W. Um, you know, I, Again, I'm I'm not a rock crawler. I'm I'm not the guy that looks. Oh, can I can I drive up that for the sake of driving up it? There has to be something on the other end for me. Um, so to be able to have a you know a, a snow peak rated tire, um, that's just that's huge for me. And yeah. there's only two tires out there, I believe, that have that, and that's the you know the BFG All Terrain KO2 and the and the Falcons. And in my experience, um, the the Falcons just seem to last a little bit longer. Um, and I sure. like the fact that it's kind of a, still an OE tire. Yeah. Um, OE spec tire and the methods look great. You know, my kind of thing these days is black vehicles with bronze wheels and the methods look, looks good. They look, they look really good. Um, you know, how did the black hold up to all the desert pinstriping in Baja? It was, it was fine. Like it's it was? pretty good paint. You know, the nice thing with the Wrangler is again, it's purpose, it's purpose built, you know? So you have your fenders that are out, you know, probably at, at the max from the center of the body, 12 inches. Yeah. So you can really kind of, if you're a skilled driver, um, you can, you can kind of work your way around it. Like I don't have really any pinstriping on the car. Oh, that's great. Um, you know, if you think about it, the cab isn't actually that long. Right. Um, and I'm used to driving press cars where scratching them is not an option. So, right. um, that's good. Yeah. The, the paint quality seems good. I mean, you know, it's, it's had a lot of gas station car washes and, um, when I say gas station car wash, I mean, everything is so dirty. I literally take the little squeegee and clean it. Um, yeah, the, I, I'm just impressed with the build quality on the vehicle. I know a lot of people with Chrysler and with Jeep have quality control concerns and it's just never been an op. It's never been an issue for me. I mean, I how many miles sorted a lot of that out in the last decade? How many miles have we put on, you oh. know, Jeep? press cars. Hundred, yeah. Hundreds of thousands and, and not a single failure ever. Yeah. I mean, the yeah. only thing is that like, the windshields constantly break. Like mine's broken right now. And I just, mine's been broken for 10,000 miles. And I just, cause well, you know, yeah, it's you just going to happen again. Right. You know, yeah, anytime um, you take an, a flat upright piece of glass, yeah. but somehow the G wagon windows don't get broke. I don't know what the difference is. Yeah. So well, maybe the G wagons are just always driving so much slower. <laughs> yeah. Man, yeah. Mine's, <laughs> mine's broken. <laughs> Yeah, I had to replace mine recently. Yeah. Um, but the Jeeps always, always need to replace the glass. It seems like. Yeah. Well. But I think the big thing is the camper on this, you know, it's, it's actually not 
that modified, you know, stock bumpers, stock winch mount. I put a worn uh, Xeon uh, winch on there with their Spidura synthetic rope. It's the platinum yeah, great edition. Winch. Great winch. Just fantastic. Um, you know, the thing that I actually like, I, I like that, um, you know, the remote control kind of setup. It's, it's pretty beefy. Um, you know, it also means that no, there's no traditional, um, you know, release, clutch release, clutch yeah. release on it. So nobody can really mess with it. Um, yeah, that is, that's definitely an advantage. I wish that they had some form of a, of an override, override yeah. of, a, of a way to plug in another remote, um, even as an option. I think that that would be nice because there's times where you forget to charge the remote or yeah. you lose the charge cable or you know, Definitely. The, the tides coming in uh, as far as performance though, that, that winch is unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously, you know, I put max trucks on it. I'm full disclosure. I'm the max trucks guy, this truck. Um, the reason I can have these things is because I'm the, I'm the importer for max trucks in the U S so you can see it at all the shows that we're at. Um, I regeared it to 488s. I think one of the interesting things on the Gladiator from what from talking to the engineers that actually designed it, um, you know, the the payload of the vehicle is kind of, you know, limited by two things. One was actually the airflow coming into the engine. That's why the Gladiator um has the different mesh behind the behind the grill is to promote more airflow from the higher wattage fan. And the second is actually the gearing. So one of the reasons why the sport model has such a higher payload is one it has less less features on it weighs less weighs sure. less um but also it has smaller tires with the 411s so i actually went to 488s um and i used dana spicer gear so factory gears um that went into the dana axles i used dana spicer diff covers and you know it's all just a it's a good factory looking package you know everything's kind of salt sprayed to factory specifications it's not going to rust um I, I actually, you know, I said, I kind of joked around that I won't have this vehicle. I, I really think this might be the one that I have for a while. Um, again, especially with that camper on the back, that thing is so well insulated and so well made. Yeah. Let's talk about that AT Overland camper. What, what made you decide on that, on that model? I know it was one of the first ones available. It was one of the first ones, um, you know, our warehouse is right next to AT. Um, I've, I've had other wedge campers. I think the go fast is a great option too. You know, we really, we really wanted to build more of a little sailboat inside. And what the, what the AT summit offered me was the ability to have things like a, a dual pane acrylic window. Um, it allowed me to have, oh, yeah, 30, that's right. they run the turn. Overland yeah. The turn window. overland windows. Um, it's, it's a foam core, um, you know, sandwiched aluminum construction. So it actually has 30 millimeters of insulation and in the built into the walls. And then it's carpeted inside for, for condensation it's really easy to put up and down. You can put solar panels on the roof. It has channels for that, for all your wiring. Um, you know, the roof is actually insulated as well. Um, and then the tent fabric actually has four layers on it. Now there's a, there's a insulation kit um, that, is, that is optional, but literally just pulls out like a jacket liner with Velcro. And that has a, an, an outer layer, um, you know, to kind of prevent that condensation coming from the tent itself as thin slit and then another white interior layer. And it's really quiet inside. I have to say we sleep really well. So you don't get a lot of flapping and zipper noise no and flapping. Well, there's no zippers. Oh, that's huge. Everything's all Velcro, you know, it's designed. Mario knows what yeah, he's he doing. Knows what he's doing. He's, you know, he, he, he spends a lot of time in these things. And, uh, yeah, we put a, we put a diesel heater in it. You know, we have the MSA drawers in it. Um, you know, we have a drop slide with a national Luna, um, weekend or 50 fridge. We, we really like that fridge because it, we have the ability to make ice, um, and margaritas. Yeah. Margaritas without ice are <laughs> really, really uncivilized and that's not overlanding. That's called car camping. Um, you know, so the, the diesel heater is great. We finally kind of got that thing figured out and, um, you know, we, we even use that thing down in Baja. It's, it's. It, it, it has the ability to smoke you out or the ability to kind of keep you warm. And, and in terms of use of space, that bed also uh, articulates up. So when you're in the camper, um, you, you not only do you have about three feet at the end of the bed, um, since the, the bed does go over the cab of the cab, truck sure. quite a bit, um, you know, you can then push that bed up as on struts. Again, the bed is also 30 millimeter foam core insulated material. So you're not sleeping on a cold surface. 
but then you get the full use of the space inside. You don't have to, um, you know, make your bed every day. You leave your bedding in there. There's enough space. So if you got to hunker down in bad weather, you can do it. Yeah, you can hang out in there. And, you know, we've put some alley, kept the interior very simple. You, you have to respect the payload of capacity of a vehicle. And I think a lot of overlanders just, they throw more and more and more and more and more. They never take it in way. And more. Yeah. And more. Yeah. Um, this is really modular for us. So, you know, we have a lifesaver jerry can for water. It's very light. Also, we do a lot of travel overseas. You know, maybe we'll take this vehicle on the Silk Road. Um, so the ability to have water filtration, pressurized water, and water storage in one unit was huge. And those alley boxes are great because they're just so light. We can leave them outside. They're right. waterproof. So then we get that interior space. If we have to hunker down and it's bad weather, we can put all that stuff outside and and, and get that space. And, and you don't have much on top. I think you've got some max tracks and max tracks are on the side. Um, the side. and we just have an overland solar 160 watt panel. Okay. And does um, that seem to run everything that you need it to, you know, we have a 170 amp hour lithium battery. Oh, that's huge. It's, it's massive. It's like what you would put in an RV essentially, you know, for those that don't know, um, lithium has a hundred percent state of charge. So there's actually 170 usable amp hours roughly in that battery. And I'm sure the few bottom ones are a bit not there, but um, as compared to an AGM battery, this is like four, almost three or four lead acid batteries. Um, yeah, you know, impressive technology in, in like 50 pounds or something. Yeah. So, so yeah, the, the solar panels there, but I have to worry about that like a week into camping. So, well, there's um, a couple other campers on the market. Now there's the, the new one from 5010. The one, yeah, thing, that I, one, the one thing nice. I liked about that was it was really Big on the inside. Huge. Because of the way it overhangs yes. the back of the vehicle. Great use of space. Yeah, you have to you have to use the the flatbed system that they provide as well. And it it does end up getting very expensive, like near the nearly the price of the vehicle by the time you get it all done. Yeah, more than the sport that you're talking about. Right. If you want um, the fully built out interior. But they do they do a great job with that. I think Goose Gear is the one. Goose Gear is the US distributor for that. Bring um, those in. I I really did like the big open space on the inside of that. Uh, and then there's a couple others on the market. There's the, there's the P core from, from, which is Australia. more of a canopy style. It is. It's um, definitely not a camper. Um, it looks great. I mean, it looks really, really yeah, good. If I wanted a utilitarian setup, um, you know, with that flatbed, you'd really gain a lot of usability from the truck and the ability to take that, that canopy on and off so easily. They've really designed that well. And I want to say it integrates water. Yeah. And they're like, they're under 10 grand for that, for the tray. And it, it's quite attractive. Um, uh, yeah. I think it looks really good on the truck. It, it looks very purposeful. You just can't sleep in it. You still have to sleep in a roof. So I have to have something. a tent or something yeah. like that. Um, yeah. Go fast does make something um, for it too. They're, they're a great option. The thing I like with them is they're really light. Um, they're great for somebody that wants something, maybe a step above a roof tent. Um, if you have no ambitions of you know, making your little sailboat inside. Um, I think that that's also a really great option. And I'm sure most of the wedge camper people have one. I haven't seen anything from four wheel camper. Yeah. That's what I was thinking about. It'll be, it'll be cool when we start to see yeah. four wheel camper releasing models that fit in the gladiator. Cause with a 1700 pound payload, it's, I mean, they sell those things all day long for Tacomas. Yeah. And this is such a better platform. You, I think you can so. just tell that it handles the weight better for sure. Um, you know, my, my partner's dad has a, a new uh, Ram 1500 and we were kind of sitting underneath and comparing his to mine. And there's, there are truthfully a lot of shared components in the same rear Which brakes. Which makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's great. Um, you know, it's, it's, I want to say it's the only vehicle that has rear discs. Does the Ranger have rear discs? I think so. Yeah. yeah and then so does the Colorado. Colorado too. does now too. The cool. Tacoma is the only one that doesn't. Ugh. It still has drums in the back. Yeah. I think they had some reason for it that made no sense, but. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. But. Um, so what's next for the Gladiator? I mean, you've, you've driven it down Baja. I mean, where, where do you want to take it next? What do you next plan to modify on the vehicle? You know, we're, we're definitely looking at, um, you know, Yukon, Northwest Territories, Alaska this summer. Um, if, if work allows it, um, you know, we're lucky that we're able to travel as much as we are, but we have to kind of respect that too. We do have a business to run. Um, so ho hopefully that's the next big trip. I mean, you know, we're always doing weekend stuff. Um, you know, we're going to intend to hit some more stuff in, in Arizona and probably go back down to Baja in March. Um, 
weather's just so perfect there. Um, you know, it, it eventually, even though I built this, I, I built my dream Land Cruiser. Diesel has all the secondary fuel tanks, everything you can imagine, like completely mechanically injected and, and everything. Um, it's also one of our show trucks. And um, I don't know. I, I don't know if that's the vehicle I would drive around the world anymore. You know, we're we're starting to to kind of plan the Silk Road idea maybe for 2021. And I think it would be hard to be not take the Gladiator. It. It's the, the fatigue on the driver is so much less because there are those days when you, when you, when you don't have unlimited time, you do have to put in those 10, 12, 14 hour driving days and the ability to turn on that radar cruise control and just kind of go and, um, I don't know. It's nice. When uh, you it, get to Mongolia, you'll, it'll only shut off with the, the camels. And the, <laughs> yeah. And it's, and, and it's, it's quiet inside too. I mean, I know that's kind of where the gladiator has received some negative marks um, is interior cabin noise, but I think it really depends on how you have it set up. I actually, I put a, uh, downloaded an app, a decibel meter, and it was right about 68 um, decibels if I remember correctly. And that's kind of what they considered a conversation level. Um, definitely if you're doing 90 mile an hour with a headwind, which the truck will do like we did across Texas from, you know, coming back from over the next week. So yeah, it's a little bit louder, but, um, that's when I notice it is when, once the speed gets up over legal limits, that's when it really gets a lot louder. Yeah. There's only so much you can do, but you're only doing that in America. That's right. Um, you'd never get going that fast. No. So unless you're on the Autobahn, maybe. Yeah. So that, that's, that's kind of take it around the Nürburgring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be your first time around the Nürburgring. We'll be, yeah. in, we'll be in a gladiator. I love uh, it. Yeah. So big plans for the, for the vehicle in terms of um, where you want to, where we want to take yeah, it. I, sure. I don't really know. Like, yeah, I, I need to find a better solution for, for rear shocks. But other than that, I think what's great about the gladiator is Jeep has done so much. Like I don't have to do an S pod because I already have the factory thing that's controlled through the, the screen. I, I, there's just so much I don't have to do. It, it has great lights. Um, it rides well, it, you know, the, the control arm angles are nearly flat lifted. Yeah. Um, and that keeps that roll center really low. Yeah. It's, we built this vehicle to travel and that's, that's our modification is, is travel. Yeah. Hopefully all the money that you think you need to spend on modifications because it doesn't need it. You can just spend on fuel now. Exactly. I love that. Exactly. Well, anything else going on with like any new gadgets you've been Pick it up recently. Ooh, I do have one. I do have one. I used it extensively in Baja and I now use it to light my, my nightly campfire inside my house. That was the wrong way to say that. Um, I'm not called campfires. fireplace. Fireplace. I don't <laughs> light fires inside of my house. Um, yeah, it's this little Covea butane torch. It's called the fire Z. Um, I don't know. I, I think I bought it on Amazon. It was like 20 bucks or something. And what I like is it uses little butane canisters, which are available everywhere in the world, everywhere in the world. We actually moved all of our stuff over to Covea with the little butane canisters because um, it's a very energy dense source. But with this, it, it, even on full blast, it doesn't seem to use much. And it is the the best fire starter I've used. I've had the Snow Peak one. I still have the Snow Peak one and actually used them side by side. Theirs is called the Giga Torch. But the problem with theirs, while it is more aesthetically pleasing and more unique, more of an experience to start that fire, which is a, what Snow Peak is about. There's no, you have, still have to have a separate lighter. Yeah, it's like kicking off a, an F4 Phantom when that thing. Could. And it's kind of scary because <laughs> it's like, you know, it starts and then it goes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, where this awesome. thing has a little trigger. It's very, very ergonomic. I use it every night. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know why more people don't carry something like that with them because. Yeah, it's all about fire when you're out camping. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I, I get some people, if, if they're only doing this on a weekend, they want to be the boy scout and they want to start the perfect fire. Well, talk to me after a few hundred nights and you just want that <laughs> sucker started. <laughs> you do. So yeah, that's right. Um, Absolutely. I don't know. What, what about you? What's, what's your, well, I, I bought this, uh, this GX 470 a couple of years ago and yeah. I've just been daily driving it or taking it on such great cars. Fingers. They are. And form factor is perfect. And I just haven't done anything to it yet. I mean, literally it's still stock after a couple of years, which I think that's the longest I've gone with any vehicle ever, but I just now got everything on order. So cool. Almost everything is here at the office. And we're going to start building that truck up. We've got a bunch of ARB goodies and cool. some AV wheels. And yeah, yeah, I think it'll look, I think it'll look. Yeah. Cause great. AV does wheels for, for six Toyota. lug Toyota. Now they do. are yeah. you doing anything in interior? 
Not, it's going to be a typical Scotty build. So it'll okay. be super Sano, very understated, yeah. not a bunch of, of complex systems. But one thing I would like to do is look at like a Shieldman seat or a Recaro or something like that, because the factory, it's the one real negative in most Toyotas is the factory seats. Yeah. Uh, the factory leather is just garbage. So it definitely needs a seat upgrade. So that might be the one thing that I do on the interior. Um, I was thinking about maybe taking out part of the rear seat and running the fridge back there to get the weight a little further forward. That'd be cool. Do like a goose gear seat delete. We yeah, did, we did like a goose gear seat delete in the gladiator. And you like that? Um, yeah, that's, that's Dax actual seat. Now I nice. did the, the, whatever they call it, the, the three quarter deletes. We still have the one seat and oh man, fantastic. And do you, do you put him in a harness when he's in the car? Do you, do he's, you, he's you almost 80 pounds and he's big and he moves around a lot. Greyhounds yeah. are, are, are very particular, um, little, little wonderful guys and girls, but I wish I could. It just, yeah. He would, it would be the Greyhound stream of death. Yeah. You know, the moment he like got himself tangled and, you know, felt he was locked down. You know, we just drive like we have a, an infant in the car oh, yeah. going he's home your, from he's your baby. ER. Yeah. Yeah. He's your yeah. Baby. Well, and speaking of that, tell us a little bit more about what people can do uh, either to help support Greyhound rescues or to, to get their own Greyhound. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've talked about this before, but huge Greyhound guy I absolutely changed my life. Um, you know, look at your local Greyhound adoption club. Um, they're all vol- usually volunteer run. You know, these dogs don't have the best life. Usually, you know, they're, they come from the track. They're not, I don't want to say that they're abused, but they're treated like a commodity. Yeah. They don't feel like part of the family. Yeah. And oh, man, they're just, they're, they're so sweet. He um, is such a sweet dog. Amazing. And this guy, we, we had him for a month and took him down Baja. And now this is his second trip and second, you know, going in the second year we've had him doesn't bark. They're just, they're, they're great. There's a great community on Instagram surrounding these dogs. If you want to look at, you know, I always say hashtag, you know, hashtag Greyhound, hashtag adopt a Greyhound. Take a look at them. They're, they're wonderful little creatures. Yeah, no doubt. Well, thanks for sharing that, Matt. And thanks for telling us all about your gladiator. Uh, I think it's going to be really exciting to see this vehicle come to market in in more numbers and see how people start to personalize them, see the integrated systems that are going to come out. I think it's going to be very cool to see how this car develops over the years. Yeah. The fact that in 2020 we have a, well, soon to be available turbo diesel, but a turbo diesel manual solid axle pickup truck that you can take the doors and roof off. Yeah. It's like, how how is that not cool? cool? Like, like why would you want to drive the, I don't know, whatever, anything else. (laughs) I don't know. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Life is fun. Have fun. Yeah, no doubt. Well, thank you all for listening. And remember, it's all about the experience. Uh, Spend less on your vehicle than you do on your trips. And we will talk to you next time. Take care guys.